Hello, I'm Ian Horn, and you're watching a documentary on financial advice in the UK. Now, why the hell are you doing that? Well, let me explain. I spent the last five years of my career speaking to financial advisors across the nation, and I'd like to pass on some of what I've learned. Some of it might give you peace of mind, some of it might make you richer, or better yet, happier. Some context. In the UK, the average amount of disposable income being saved is 4.5%. 71% of households have less than £10,000 in savings. This is a nation that needs financial advice, but doesn't seek it. It's also a nation that has experienced the financial advice revolution, but nobody really knows about it. Let's change that. So, leave your preconceived notions at the door, because we're going on a UK tour, and it'll be fun. Look, I'm even wearing shorts. It's not an original gag, but it's the one you're getting. Let's take a dive into the world of financial advice. On this UK tour, we'll look at the value financial advisors bring and the things that prevent people from getting proper help for all of their financial needs. We're going to look at everything from life goals to technology to uh, Buddhism. Yes, Buddhism. We begin in Manchester, where we're going to chat with my friend Kasal Ariawanza, a highly qualified advisor who's invited me to join him at the Kethamati Temple in Withenshaw. I want to ask what the point of financial advice is and why he would choose to make a career out of it. Kassal, thank you for joining me. Um, Pleasure. As you can see, we're really going hard on the, on the Buddhism thing today. Um, I want to ask you some questions about financial advice. I also want to ask you some questions about Buddhism. So to start with, um, what value did a financial advisor bring? Financial advice is very important to people, the public, all of us, because it addresses various needs, various needs from people's basic needs, such as wanting to feel safe, moving on to wanting to improve, to progress, right through to wanting to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So you can class that as moving from uh, the obvious areas to the not so obvious, right through to the deep. How does a Buddhist end up being a financial advisor? You know, what, how does that come about? Well, um, that's, that's an interesting one because you have to go back to my childhood. The way I was brought up, I grew up in Sri Lanka and as a child, we were always told that you must do something for the world, the people around you, that is worthy, that helps people. So everybody needs money and help around money. And if I can help people achieve their three primary objectives, which is the need to feel safe, the need to improve, and then to enjoy, that is where I come in, in helping others. I find it interesting that Casal is keen to discuss purpose rather than investments or other financial products. Aren't financial advisors just supposed to make you richer? Thankfully for me, my next stop is Altrincham, where Tamsin Kane is going to elaborate on this. Tamsin calls herself a lifestyle financial planner, but what in the name of all things holy does that even mean? Okay, uh, Tamsin, thank you for joining us. I'm going to start with a really basic question for you, a basic question for you perhaps, maybe not for people watching. Okay. What is a lifestyle financial planner? Okay, so a lifestyle financial planner is somebody who looks at the lifestyle of the people who are set in front of them, um, finds out exactly what their income is, their expenditure is, what money they've got in their world, and they work out how they can use all of those things to get the life that they really want and make sure they're not going to run out of money at mm -hmm. the end of it. And how is that a progression from advice in the past? You know, we, we, there's a misconception that advisors are, you know, stuffy old blokes in grey suits. Just like uh, me. Exactly, just, just, <laughs> just like you there. <laughs> you know, so how, how is that a progression of financial advice that people might have experienced, say, 10 years ago? Okay, so I started off in a fairly traditional IFA practice. Um, and so if you'd have come in and said, could you review my pension? We'd have reviewed your pension for you. We might have asked what are the investment savings that you had, but we wouldn't have looked at what your hopes were, what your dreams were, what your aspirations were, what your fears are, what money was like for you as a child, so we can understand how that might influence the sort of behaviours that you've got nowadays. It's a huge step in the, in the right direction. Yeah, and that's actually really interesting because I think there's an assumption that people go to a financial advisor and say, how much money can you make me? <laughs> what happens when someone comes in and says that to you? Um, if they have a really good reason for wanting a particular amount of money. So if, well, how much money can you make me? Well, why do you want that? Well, I want to be able to, um, I don't know, build a church in India um, and this is what it's gonna cost. Fine. 
if it's because you like stockpiling money. Bye-bye. That's a great account of lifestyle financial planning, but how does the experience work for Tamsin's clients? Let's hear from two of them, Nikki and Jeff. It was what we were looking for, but I think, and I think it's become probably, or it's, it's delivered more than we expected, mm -hmm. I guess, in terms of looking at all the different options. I, I don't think we perhaps understood that the software that's used can allow very, very quick variations in assumptions or scenarios, which has, I guess, led to most recent, well, 12 months ago when I stopped working full time to basically being able to think, okay, what happens if, you know, what happens if I only get a job which pays half of what I'm being paid now? What happens if, what happens if Nick retires when I retire? Or that scenario planning, I think, is probably the biggest and most useful thing. I think the big, the, the big issue was that when we came to be thinking about changing pensions, what, managing them ourselves, um, I didn't just want to go and find somebody that would say, we'll take it and we'll manage it. What, what we knew we wanted was something, something that would tell us more about what's going to happen over the next 20, 30 years. I didn't know whether that existed. That, yeah. was the, that was the thing. And all we'd experienced before were financial advisors saying, stick your money here, here and here. We've made a good start. Financial advice, planning, or whatever you prefer to call it, appears to be a force for good. But does the British public realise this? The answer is a big fat no. Recent research found that only 7% of people in the UK would seek financial advice to deal with their money issues, and that 40% don't know where to look for advice. Also, 49% of respondents disagreed with the notion that they would actually benefit from free access to money advice. Our next stop is Glasgow and a rooftop chat with Ibiza DJ turned financial advisor Adrian Murphy. Once the office dog stops eating our lens cap, Adrian will explain how technology can get people more interested in financial advice. People say financial advisors are old and boring. Yes. You're only one of those things. <laughs> so I'll let you guess which. Why aren't people engaging with financial advice? Yeah, I think that's probably part of it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's seen as inaccessible. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the value of it either and, and a lot of the time we, when we meet people, particularly you know, y younger people, maybe 30s, 40s, even sometimes younger, there's a mistrust, misconceptions yeah. or I can't afford it. Yeah, what are those misconceptions? Because that, that's coming out you know, yeah. from meetings I've had yeah, over the years. Yeah, yeah. What, what do people expect from a financial advisor? <sighs> They don't, they don't, that, one of the problems is they don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the perception is that it's, it's investments, right? Yeah. So unless you've got a million quid or half a million quid or something, then you, you can't get advice. Don't realise that you could just pay for advice. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily about that. And, and let's talk about technology, because I know, you know at Murphy Group you have brought in some technology yeah, to help yeah. bring client um, portfolios and client investments and also their planning to life. Yes. Um, so what have you done there? Um, we partnered with, with Money Info, uh, that's our kind of principal client facing technology um, to, to, to uh, create a, a portal. So they've got a portal, branded it up. It's fantastic. I mean, at a very basic level, it gives clients uh, a view of everything in one place. Yeah, is there an app for the phone or anything yes, like that? Can yes. I so there's an app the for the phone. We can send instant messages to them. They can send instant messages to us. We post the documents to their, 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 their library after meetings. So it covers off the kind of data security stuff, which is super important. And is, is technology helping you engage with younger people? <sighs> Not yet, no. No, I don't think so. I think um, on social media, yes. Uh, so I guess you could you could you could put that into that bracket, but um, from a from a, an advice perspective, I don't think so. Financial advice is progressing, so why aren't we all getting advice? Research from Quilter shows that advice firms need a minimum of one thousand pounds in fee income each year to service a client, which means you probably won't get advice unless you've got at least thirty grand to invest. And does the public really value advice? A recent survey showed that most people think it's worth £99 per session. There's a problem here. We call this problem the free advice gap, and it refers to the estimated 19.8 million people in the UK who might want advice but can't afford or access it. This gap has gone up 5 million from where it was four years ago. It's a fairly ridiculous situation. Not as ridiculous as the Duke of Wellington's hat, but not as funny either. To talk me through it, I've brought in two of my favourite advisors, Nicola and Jennifer Ellis from Wellington Wealth. 
So why is it that people can't afford financial advice then? RDR, um, which brought professionalism and also um, transparency to the industry, but it's perhaps one of the unintended consequences that it's kind of raised the bar, I think, for advisors um, for a minimum investment amounts because it's just regulatory costs has meant it has been well, it's expensive to, to advise the, or costly for a company. But what do you think we need to do to make financial advice more accessible to more people? Yeah. We've obviously seen the rise of robo-advice over the last sort of five, ten years, um, but I don't think that's necessarily going to plug the gap because it's not, it's, it's maybe promoting a particular investment, a particular wrapper, but it, it is more the, the face-to-face -face advice and that that's what's lacking obviously there, the, the human interaction. Um, but just how you can replicate that, I'm not sure. Maybe AI will be the way forward. And um... I mean, there's several AI solutions recently have come out and there's, you know, we are sort of speaking to somebody that has a, another interesting AI solution that, again, might be the one that, that's going to yeah. help, um, which is part face-to-face, -face, part AI. So um, I think that, that could plug a gap. You know, I think we need more taught at schools. You know, there's not enough learning about financial advice to, to find out what it is um, so knowledge is definitely something that, that's needed probably schools um, and even in the workplace i think as well you know education you know from from school age even primary secondary but also maybe into the workplace because um, i suppose employers maybe have a duty now with auto enrollment they've got a duty to try and you know make their employ their employees a bit more financially savvy if yeah. you like continuous learning is something we've always loved um, and i think that's what people need to do because you're what you need to know in financial advice changes throughout your life. Education can help, but you may have picked up on Nicola mentioning the RDR regulation, which stands for Retail Distribution Review and was introduced in 2012. RDR is a boring acronym, but it's important, as it's at the heart of the financial advice revolution that I mentioned earlier. In short, it ensured that advisors met higher qualification standards and made sure that advisors can't simply make money by claiming commissions on the money you invest. The advisor is now held to higher standards and must show they are acting in your best interests. And yet, six years on from this change, the Financial Conduct Authority found that only 39% of people actually trust regulated advisors. A bad reputation is hard to shift. And now to London, the heart of the UK's financial services sector. Seeing as we're in the city, I've bothered with a full suit, and I'm here to speak to Keith Richards, the CEO of Britain's biggest financial advice body, the Personal Finance Society. I'm going to ask him some tough questions. So every time I meet you, you're wearing really, really nice fitted shirts. Where are you getting them from? <laughs> okay, just kidding, but I do want to know if the RDR has worked. Okay, so Keith, people watching this documentary will have seen me giving a, well, heard me giving a spiel about the retail distribution review and what it means. Has it actually worked? Uh, in many ways, it has worked. Uh, it has created much greater transparency. Uh, it has drift, driven different behaviours in the market. In other ways, it hasn't because it's continued to create social exclusion. So we, we know that the government were particularly worried about uh, the identification of an advice gap, the fact that uh, the wealthy were being well served, but actually those with, uh, I think the government phrased it as hardworking people who wanted to do the right thing in life we're finding it difficult to access advice. So, uh, so the answer, unfortunately, is yes in, in many ways and, and no in others. Yeah, so do you, do you basically now have to have loads of money in order to see a financial advisor? No, that's not entirely true, but that is the perception. So that sometimes puts people off of engaging an advisor because they think it's gonna be very expensive. Um, whereas there are many financial advisors who will create the right level of charging structure relevant to the the needs of the client and not every advisor restricts who they deal with based on their asset worth but that is the perception so it's, it's interesting you bring in the international aspect of it of course because you know people watching this documentary i assume are going to be uk based you know internationally where does the uk kind of stand in terms of quality of financial advice and financial planning uh, there's no question in my mind of course i would be biased that, <laughs> that i think the uk is the gold standard uh, and generally that is recognised around the world. Advice is improving, but there is still plenty to do. And what about people who are having financial difficulties? The TUC estimates that UK households owe an average of £15,385 to credit card firms, banks and other lenders. Other research suggests that almost half of the UK is unable to save any money for the future. So what can you do if you can't speak to an advisor? It turns out that you need guidance rather than advice, and no, they are not the same thing. 
Guidance differs from advice in that it is usually free and is typically limited to information on what you are able to do. It is not regulated by the FCA. If you want more information, the Financial Advice Working Group put together a 32-page document explaining the differences in more detail. So what can you do if you can't afford advice? Who do you speak to? Let's get back to Keith. So we've got the central guidance body, we've got Money Advice Service, Citizens Advice Bureau offer high, uh, high street access up and down the country. There's many online uh, services. Many actually of the product providers provide some simple tools for consumers. All a consumer really has to do is take a bit of responsibility to just put a bit of time aside to do a bit of research and it won't be too long before you start finding some useful tools that get you thinking about money. But budgeting is key. If you don't really understand how much is coming in, how much is going out, and what you might be able to do to influence either, uh, it, that's the starting point that everyone should be at to empower them to be better informed in their financial well-being. We only have two more people to visit now, and I want to talk about pensions. Now, why should I care about pensions? I'm going to ask Romy Savova, CEO of Pension B. Okay, so Romy, thank you for joining us. I mean, as you can see, we're at, uh, we're at London Wall. Indeed. There's no reason for that. It's not even a metaphor for anything. I just thought it'd be a fun place to meet. So your work is pensions. Could you tell me why people should care about them? Well, pensions are incredibly important within the context of your life plan. So if you think about how you're going to spend your time on this earth, quite a lot of it is actually going to be in what we call a phase of retirement after the age of 55. And for many people, that's actually when life begins because you don't have your children at home anymore, hopefully. Um, you're free to do a lot more of what you want because you're winding down from work and your pension is how you should think about funding that lifestyle. So really, it's, you know, pensions are quite an exciting thing to think about in the context of what you're going to do with your money. And speaking about exciting, um, Pension B obviously uh, brings technology into the picture. So what technology can people use to, to, you know, to get the most out of their pension, to understand their pension? Well, technology is a huge enabler when it comes to pensions because pensions are notoriously boring, slightly complicated and full of tax. Um, which no person enjoys looking at for a very long period of time. Um, so technology can make all of that simpler to understand, simpler to process and really simple to manage. Um, so technology in the way we think about it at Pension B first starts with the user experience. So how are people perceiving their pensions? Do they understand the financial product behind it? Do they understand what happens when you put in contributions? And how can we use technology to make that easier for them to visualize and easier for them to see what their money is actually doing for them? A key part of technology for us is around pension consolidation. So typically, if you want to consolidate all of your pensions into one place, yeah, so you, you have to put in lots. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Most people um, have more than one these days. They switch jobs on average 11 times. So imagine leaving behind 11 different pots. Often, if you want to consolidate them, you have to fill in a bunch of paper forms. Technology can simplify that by allowing you to fill in, you know, just a couple of fields about yourself and your old jobs and get those pensions into one place where again technology can help you see what they're doing for you over time through the help of an app um, and so on. Pensions are associated with old people and yet they are all about looking to the future. In a similar vein, I'm heading to Bournemouth Beach now. I want some sunshine and I also want to speak to Kevin Forbes. Kevin is passionate about improving the future of financial advice and he's also got the best hair in the business. Kevin, thank you for joining me in Bournemouth, sunny Bournemouth today. Always sunny Bournemouth. Always sunny Bournemouth. First question for you is, where are you buying your shampoo? Today, I got it from Lush, just around the corner, which is a good local pool business, a bit like Strategic Solutions. How about that? Great plug. Okay, first question really, a serious one. <laughs> We're here to talk about financial advice and younger people. Um, so firstly, do you think younger people really get sufficient financial education in the UK? Uh, not at all, yeah. I think it's a slam dunk that, that they don't get any, really. I know the part of the curriculum allows them to do it in some of their, um, their extra lessons, but it should be a subject on its own. And uh, I think it's unbelievable that it's not. And I know you've done some really good work in this space. So, so what have you done to engage younger people with financial advice? So a group of us in the region um, have set up a, the Future Advice Project, which is all about getting uh, university students in their placement year, so those between years, years uh, two and three, um, out and about and working in financial planning offices. So most of them were intending on being maybe you know, stockbrokers or investment managers or accountants or something. 
but it's just to say to him, have you ever thought about you know, not being that dull, being a bit more interesting, <laughs> and being a financial advisor instead? Yeah, so, but why is it less dull? Uh, because I think we're nicer people than, than the other groups of people for a start. <laughs> I think we're, we are the trusted advisor. I think uh, lawyers, uh, accountants, and investment managers generally are very uh, transactional roles, whereas a proper financial planner is right at the heart of what his clients are doing, and they listen to you, and you're there for you know, 20, 30, 40 year relationships. So it's a completely different relationship to just bumping into your account when you need your accounts done, or going to see the lawyer when you're in trouble generally. Yeah, so, so what other reasons are there for younger people to think about careers in financial advice? Uh, I think um, it's, it's uh, re rewarding on lots of levels, so the obvious one being um, financially, because of supply and demand there aren't many of us left so we get paid uh, more, um, maybe too much for some people, and uh, second it's rewarding because you actually do make a difference, so cheesy whatever, but, but you do change things in clients' lives for the better and, and, and they appreciate that and you do become a part of the, their, their family unit. Okay, and what skills do people need if they're going to get into that career? Uh, I think uh, of average or average or above intelligence, that's all really, not have to be super intelligent. Uh, I think empathy is, is the one thing that people miss out on. And I think it's mostly about attitude, so do you, you, know, do you want to do it? I think anybody who wanted to be a good financial planner could be one. Uh, just it's a, it's a bit of a weird thing and people don't know that they want to be one because they don't know what one is, because they mostly yeah. haven't got one in their family. And with that, we finish our UK adventure. I've taken you to some of the liveliest cities in the UK. We found out where Kev gets his shampoo and we've also found out where Keith gets his fitted shirts. More importantly though, hopefully I've outlined the case for seeking proper financial advice or guidance. So, a quick recap, some top tips for those of you looking for financial assistance. Firstly, if you can afford advice, check out a financial advice directory such as Unbiased, Vouched For or Advisor Book to see who operates in your area. Make sure that your advisor is listed on the FCA register. Do some research before you meet and see what the service is about. No two advice businesses are the same. You may also want to see if your advisor holds a chartered or fellowship status with one of the key professional bodies. And finally, look for someone who asks about your priorities, needs and aspirations, rather than someone who is just trying to sell you things. And if you're in the UK and seeking financial help free of charge, see if organisations such as the Citizens Advice Bureau or the Money Advice Service can help. There may be other local organisations in your region too. Sadly, that's all we've got time for. I've been Ian Horn, and you've just watched a documentary on financial advice in the UK. Yes, you have literally just done that. Thank you so much for joining me.